Lily Hudson Hope, or just Lily Hope now. And Gunafchish, I stand before you today with gratitude for all the people and the spirits who brought me here. I'm not gonna lose it. Okay. <laughs> Hold it back. <laughs> um, My heart is so full from being out there and weaving and being with all its weavers um, and now being here in this room to share this with you. I'm going to begin with a quote that uh, Richard King who, 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 gave at Celebration 1988 from Ha Tu Wan Ha Tu Yes by the Downhowers. He said, It is as if his words are like a robe pulled over our shoulders, a strength-giving robe. Again, my name is Lily Ho. My Tlingit name is Wushkin Dengaat. My mother's people are Raven Duck Ding Tan from the Snail House of Alaska. I am Lake Kayari, and I am a weaver. I stand here today because I'm concerned for our weavers and for the admirers of our work. We're here struggling to understand the Tlingit ways of being and knowing in regards to our weavings and our worldview is maybe skewed by knowing only English. We've lost some of the important messages in translation. We need to revitalize the integrity of these teachings and thus honor our origins and our teachers. Maybe we've forgotten our beginnings and our commitments and our gratitudes to these ancient weaving practices. So let me start with just a little bit of my weaving beginnings, my teachers and my gratitudes here. I learned Raven's Tail weaving over 18 years ago from my mother, Clarissa Rizal. And in 2004, I studied again with Kate Parker at the University of Alaska Southeast. And um, here she is, these uh, photographs are from her show at the State Museum here in Juneau. Um, so I'm now learning and teaching Chilcat weaving with my mother, Clarissa Rizal, who apprenticed with the last master weaver, Jenny Clinot. As a teenager, I couldn't really sit still. I, I may have been, I have this weird memory that I may have been locked in my room and like forced to weave. I don't think I really was, but it felt like that. You, know, you can't do anything until you weave this, another two rows. So I didn't take to it really well as a teen, but I remember. And the, I remember how, like, the counting was so fun in Raven's Tale. I don't know if any of you have done it, but it's so fun. And I loved watching each row develop that pattern as it goes along with each row and how it forms those lines. So anyway, I came back to my Raven's Tale in my college years, taking a few classes with Kay, and I loved it. It was like revisiting a friend from childhood. I loved having my hands in the work. After those weaving classes were over, I didn't weave much anymore. I mean, finishing college is surprisingly distracting from being able to weave. <laughs> and then immediately after, I got pregnant. And one day when I was quite far along, a former weaving classmate came up and she's like, hey, did you finish that robe you were working on in class? Did you finish that? That baby's not coming out until you finish that weaving. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, the baby came out. Oh my gosh. And it was another 17 months before I finished that little robe, and then the uh, apron and headdress that goes along with it. And my mother made a tunic to finish the little ensemble we titled Copper Child, which is now in the permanent collection of Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. <laughs> Our little daughter, Elizabeth, got to wear it quite a bit before it's you know, in acquisition. A few summers ago, um, my mother offered a beginning chill cat weaving class when Elizabeth was just almost three. And I went. And I was high on life for like two weeks. I couldn't believe it had taken me so long to get to chill cat weaving. I mean, my mother's been weaving since I was five, right? So I had all sorts of opportunities. But from that class, I was hooked. There was, there was, something, there was something surreal, something out of this world. Something amazing about chill cat weaving. And all I wanted to do was weave. I mean, I knew I had to take care of my kids and my husband and keep the house clean. But oh my gosh, though, I just wanted to weave all the time. <laughs> like, immediately after that first class, my mother taught another class. And she asked me to serve as her teaching assistant, which kind of drove those techniques into my head. And I, I apologize to any of you students who were in that class for letting me learn on you or like teach you as I was learning. Oh, wait, take that out. That's not a great thing. 
so <laughs> it was great. Um, again, there was nothing like it. Just being in the room with all those projects and all that energy, everyone working on their projects, and then our friend brought out, and he brought over all these old, old chill cat ropes, and we're all standing around, like some of us were just in tears looking at this old, ancient arch. So, what? Oh, wow! Oh, oh my God. So, I'm now working on a child-sized chill cat robe, and my second child is nearly two. And recently, in the last week or so, uh, oh, there was a week or so, a little while ago, where um, I was just ridiculously happy. So happy I thought I was pregnant, because the last time I was this happy, I was pregnant. So I took a pregnancy test. <laughs> but, but I was so happy, because we had just warped up a loom, me and my friend Ricky, fellow weaver Ricky. We had just warped up my loom and his loom, and we were weaving every night, or maybe I was just in the mornings, but I was, I was just... I was so happy. I had all the motivation in the world to clean the house, and I loved playing with my kids, and I even got to fit in some quality time with my husband, and it just kind of snowballed. And then two days hit in a row where I didn't get to weave, and you should have seen me. I was so mad, I was mad. Oh, 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 oh. And it took me a bit to figure out where the resentment was coming from. I didn't want to clean the house, I didn't want to play, I didn't want to talk, I wanted nothing. If I couldn't weave, I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to weave, and I felt like all of that other stuff was keeping me from my dream. So I called my teacher, my mom, and I was like, okay, what do I do? This is really intense. And she said, uh-huh, you have to find the balance. Not all the time weaving, and not all the time housework. You don't want to resent your family, for keeping you from your loom, and you don't want them to resent you for weaving. So my commitment has to be that balance between my family and my weaving. And that's where I am with Chillcat. Chillcat weaving is the motivation to do all those tasks. The vacuuming, the alphabetizing of CDs and books, <laughs> the scrubbing of the toilet. You guys don't alphabetize your CDs. <laughs> dirty your toilet is or how disorganized the living room is and when you put that first stitch in and time stops and speeds up all at once it's like you're in this you're in this I don't even, it's like a meditation that, that's all I can say it's a it's a meditative union with something greater than us it's great there's peace there there's peace in the world you're sitting at your loom and there's peace everything is how it should be when you're weaving chill cap. That's it. I just want to weave. I want to weave all the time, and I will scrub the toilet to hear back just to weave. <laughs> I'm so grateful to be able to weave. The origin of this paper comes from a family visit to Colorado where my sister and her little family lives with our, with our mother very part-time. She comes back and forth. So just picture it. Okay, here we are. It's this gorgeous Colorado sunny day. Our mother has her loom set up outside on the, on the porch, or out, out in the yard, and um, she's taking some photographs from her blog. And um, my sister comes inside, and she's got her iPhone, you know. She goes, oh my gosh, I'm gonna Instagram this. Hey, this is Raven's Tale, right? Right? And I was like, uh, and I like laughed. I was like, uh, the one out there with the ovoids and the circles in there? Like, what? And I was laughing, I was like, just kidding, right? She's like, no, that's, that's Raven's Tale. Doesn't Mama leave Raven's Tale? And I, I stopped for a minute. I was like, wait a minute. No, seriously, that, that's Chill Cat. What you're looking outside with all those circles in it, that's Chill Cat weaving. And I laughed at the ridiculousness of that because our mother's been weaving since before my little sister was even born. So how could she be living with these textiles her entire life, both Raven's Tail and Chill Cat, hanging on the loom almost constantly? There's one or the other. How could she not know the difference between this Raven's Tail and Chill Cat weaving? So it got my thinking. I bet there's a lot of people here in Plinkett Country and across the world who don't know the difference between the two. How can we live on this land and not understand this rich art right at our fingertips? Which brings us here to explore the similarity and the differences of these weavings, their origins and how they came back to us, or maybe they were never lost, and to each, what are their spiritual strengths? 
<coughs> paper is a tapestry of my learning. Chill Cat and Raven's Tail Weaving are two high-quality hand-twined textile weaving styles practiced by the Clinket, Haida, and Simshian people of Southeast Alaska and into the Yukon and British Columbia of Canada. Thousands of these weavings live in museums across the world and in clan houses or private collections, yet if one wants to purchase a new one of these, a full-size robe in either style, there's only a few hundred, maybe even just a few dozen, who weavers you can commission one from. Similarities and differences, one can visually identify the weaving style by evaluating the design field here. If it's mostly geometric, with angles, boxes, straight lines, think Raven's Tail. If it's got a lot of form line going on with eyes and ovoids, curves, think Chill Cat. Since many weavers know both styles and now are blending them, you have to look more closely these days and you might see them kind of getting married where you'll have like the Chill Cat braid happening, the borders in Chill Cat, and then you'll have the interior as a raven's tail, the ge geometric shapes. Both the raven's tail and Chill Cat weaving are constructed on an upright loom, or as Terry Rothkar says, it's a frame because there's nothing holding the bottom of the warp with vertical hanging warp hanging down. Little socks, or in some cases out there, you saw some Crown Royal bags <laughs> hold those long warps off the floor. Um, and when you're making a robe, you have to keep those off the floor as you start, because you have to, I mean, if you've ever seen it being done, you have to start kind of sitting down, so they're gonna be dragging on the floor. So to keep them from getting messy, you wanna, you wanna put your little socks on the ends of your warp. Um, so thigh spun goat wool is traditionally used in both. Um, sorry, I'm going back to this. And it could take um, three goat hides to make one rope. So you can imagine how much work that is to go and get those hides, right? And I don't know any hunters right now that are bringing me hides. So now most of the thigh spun warp that I use, and I know there are some weavers here who have been using um, mountain goat. Beautiful, beautiful work. Thank you for keeping that alive. That is a ton of work before you even start weaving. <coughs> Um, most of this thigh spun warp is now made of merino wool, um, so we can easily get it, right? And Chill Cat also needs thin strips of cedar bark spun into the warp to add structure for the curvy line form design execution, and to keep the moths from eating this work that can take a year or more to make. Yellow cedar is preferred for the softness and less sappy stuff, but red is also okay. Some Raven's Tail weavers have been known to make drop spindle work because it's really fast, um, but this is not an option for Chill Cat as the cedar part pokes out all over, and when you start weaving over it, you're gonna have these little, like, you know, pieces of cedar poking out of your weaving. Um, actually, uh, there were a few weavers who tried to do it, spin it on their, um, in a spindle with the cedar bark in it, and it stuck out so much that as they were weaving over it, it just, I mean, it was like little porcupines poking out of their weaving, it was really cute. But not something you wanna put on your back, necessarily. <laughs> So it takes about a month to prepare and spin 800 to 1,000 yards needed for the robe. And a spinner usually completes maybe 50 yards a day maximum for avoidance of hand blisters, because when you're spinning on your leg, and you can actually see Melissa Reinhardt here spinning, a few others are spinning here in the room, but um, your hand gets really sore spinning <laughs> that work on your hand. But as we figured out, that if you don't continue to spin, you kind of lose it and your hand will start getting sore again. So spin a couple yards a day and you'll keep that, that callus going. Just keep spinning, keep spinning. <laughs> Hand dyed merino wool yarns make up the wefts of both Raven's Tail and Chill Cat. Traditional dyes include um, moss boiled in urine for the natural yellow, or soaked copper for like four months in urine for greens, steeped hemlock bark in old strong urine for black, or boiled hemlock bark with marsh mud or black soil from around decayed stumps. So that can also make black, but Cheryl Samuel notes that it, it kind of makes your yarns break down. So she says, don't use the mud so much. It's not so good. It makes your yarns break down and they kind of fluff up in your weaving. And um, George Emmons in the book, The Clinket Indians, he has great details on these traditional dye methods. So if you want to go find out and really do it for reals, you can do that. Um, most weavers today are either buying their yarns commercially or doing um, commercial dyes of the weft yarns for steadfast colors and to slow down the process of fading. So we want our colors to stay forever, right? Most weavings get trimmed with sea otter, rabbit, beaver fur, uh, although many older robes don't have this. 
and I haven't figured out, maybe you guys know why that is. Maybe you'll tell me afterwards, right? Why don't they have the fur? Was it not available? There was a bad hunting season, what was it? So a weaver can make robes uh, in either style, uh, robes, leggings, tunics, aprons, and pouches um, in, in Ch Chilcat or Raven's Tale. Or if you're like really a big tag band, you might make hair clips and pins and things like that. <laughs> Some say Chilcat is the only place you can weave a perfect circle. Chilcat weavings use many of the same shapes from the Northwest Coast form line <clears throat> with U-shapes, ovoids, circles, trigons, etc., assembled to represent animals, spirits, and persons. Patterns are often found in nature or inspired by nature. The pattern for Chilcat robes were traditionally designed by the weaver's husband. He would paint them in black only on a wooden pattern board. Uh-oh. Oh, there's a combination. Oh, good. So there's an option of Raven's Hill and Chilcat. Hey, I'm sorry, where is it? <clears throat> Where's that little guy that has our... Okay, here we go. Pattern boards. <laughs> so there's a pattern board on your left. Um, so the pattern board on your left, the weaver would use as a guide. And um, many weavers are now using plastic transparencies, you can see on the right, so that holding those up to um, match up the weaving shapes is a little more exact. I can't even imagine, I, I've never done a weaving from a pattern board, but I can't imagine looking at that and like measuring that out and then like making the shape and then measuring it again. It's so awesome to hold up a transparency and say, oh yeah, look, it matches. So, um, the main figure in a chill cat robe is often an animal form, conventional or symbolic, uh, very like what's shown on all flat surfaces, like the 2D stuff, on um, house fronts, skin robes, and sides of chests. Um, on Chilcat blankets, the design field is broken. Can we find one? Find one! The design is traditionally uh, divided vertically into three fields. The larger central one presenting the figure opened out, while the narrow side divisions um, serve merely as decoration or decorative. Um, this arrangement of the blanket design is to show the figure at its best advantage. Um, for as the blanket is worn over the shoulders, the main figure is spread out across the wearer's back. In Chilcat weaving, a weaver moves her hands through the warp, both left and right, and right to left, and adds her weaver strands as she needs to. Rather than weaving each row straight across like in Raven's Tale, the Chilcat robe, robe is, is woven in smaller design sections and then pulled together using nearly invisible drawstrings. These drawstrings used, drawstrings used to be made of whale or caribou, but current weavers use hemp cord, cotton cord, synthetic, or natural sinew to pull it all together. Chilcat uses three main techniques, um, weaving with either two-strand twine or three-strand braids, letting the weaver focus on shaping those curves and lines of her complex designs. If you've ever seen a Chilcat weaving being made, then you've seen the numerous braids in progress. There we are spinning on the fly and a little ball. But here's one in progress. And this is so mild in comparison. If we had if we had taken a photograph where the eyes were being done, there might have been like 80 braids going vertically up that she would travel down. At, um, yeah. So she'd weave a row across and then bring all these braids down and change them out. So the weaving back and forth is not necessarily what takes time in Chilcat. It's the transition of all those braids and shaping all those lines and curving around the nose and then around the teeth and the mouth and everything like that. Um, Chilcat weaving uses white, black, yellow, and green, and sparing use of red and or turquoise, although I think the green and the turquoise is now being interchanged. You can do yellow and turquoise or yellow and green in your robe, um, but there's very sparing use of red um, that we've also seen in robes. So in contrast, Raven's Tail <coughs> uses 11 variations of two and three strand finger twining techniques. Although, I'm not sure I've learned all of them. Have you guys learned all 11 techniques? Anyone, any Raven's Tale weavers in the room? Holy smokes, that's a lot. So, I, I don't know if I'm, you know, as you're weaving, you're like, wait, is this technique number four? You know, we don't have them all labeled, but um, I don't know if I know all 11. <laughs> so, these variations um, help you to weave concentric, concentric, um, one within another shapes. As you'll see on the front of this little booty here, there's that, Design there. Do you know what that's called? The pattern in that boot? 
tattoo. Is it the tattoo? So that concentric shape with the little fringe hanging down with the little cones on it, that's the tattoo design on the raven's tail. And you can do side-lying H figures or C-shaped figures, all with these black tassels hanging down, falling from the left corners. Um, Raven's tail also uses compact twining, like Chilcat, with rows right up next to each other, and frequently the borders are spiral weft, where, get this, the weaver strand will spiral around the warp. Spiral weft, right? So you can actually see them, I'm going to use this, look. Spiral weft is this right here, these little guys traveling down, where they're literally spiraling. It looks like little like stitched on applique stuff, but there are actually like eight little spirally things coming down here over these eight warp bits. Or I think it's actually 16, but that's, so it's spiraling around creating that design there. Um, a raven's tail robe is usually or a white background with black design elements with a very sparing use of yellow, although some weavers, as we've seen, are now using black warps and red wefts and more beautiful colors, making stunning variations of these traditional raven's tail weaving. Upon completing either one of these um, robes, raven's tail or chilcat, a weaver will leave a small square signature in the lower two corners of the fringe, using two or three colors in a little, like, tie-offs, I guess you could call them, but it's a little pattern. And so the next time you look at a row, see if you can find this little signature. <coughs> now, unfortunately, we don't have like a record of like, oh, that's that's so-and-so, the weaver. So when you see one, and then you see another one that looks the same, you can say that's the same weaver, but we don't have a name necessarily tagged to that. So you'll have to ask me what my signature is when I put it in. <laughs> oh, my time's getting short. Okay, okay. <coughs> So the the <laughs> I'm I'm okay. The origins of Raven's tail weaving. Anthropologists res refer to Raven's tail weaving as Northwest geometric weaving, as many designs are repeating geometric shapes. The early 1900s researcher George Emmons documented an old pattern that was known as tail feathers of the raven, and Canadian weaver and author Cheryl Samuel popular popularized the phrase raven's tail to replace using Northwest geometric weaving. We're unsure how old the oldest documented raven's tail weaving is, only that um, they predate any preserved Chilcat robes. My teacher Kate Parker says, um, well, we know they were woven along the Northwest coast until the late 1700s, and they evolved into Chilcat weaving, and that form line style of weaving began to flourish. Raven's tail weaving slept for nearly 200 years until Cheryl Samuel helped revive it in the 1980s. Um, so she actually went to St. Petersburg and took photographs and notes, and she returned uh, ready to try it out. She found out that there were all these old robes, so she unraveled some, but she got to take pictures, and using her information from uh, Chilcat, her knowledge of Chilcat weaving, she started to recreate Raven's Tail robes, which I love the full circle of that, that Raven's Tail kind of um, helped Chilcat come back, and then Chilcat helped Raven's Tail come back. I love the full circle. In addition to Samuel's work, the weavers who maintain indigenous patterns in cedar bark, spruce root, and chilcat integrate their expertise into what they learn in Raven's Tail classes, and thus this forum thrives today with hundreds of weavers, teachers, and students of diverse backgrounds, both native and non-native, helping to carry this ancient practice forward. So I'm not sure what you want to, should I go power through this, or what do you want to know? I'm power through in it, okay. Here we go. <laughs> Chilcat weavings originated at least as early as 1779, we know this. Um, years later, La Perouse. So years later, La Perouse speaks of a native manufacturer resembling tapestry, and the earliest weaving anthropologist, uh, the earliest weaving that anthropologist Emmons found was dated in 1888. One of the last master Chilcat weavers in Southeast Alaska was Jenny Thanat, um, who learned from her mother and her father's maternal cousin, Cora Benson. Sanat sold her first robe in 1908 for $50. She was 18 years old. According to her, according to Agnes Bellinger, Sanat wove over 50 robes and eight Chilcat tunics and numerous other weavings in her 96 years. Now this is pretty impressive thinking as it takes some Chilcat weavers one or two years to complete a full-size robe or tunic. Most weavers are doing other things like caring for children and cooking and working a job outside the home. If a weaver could weave all day, like a 9 to 5 job or a 9 to 9 job, she could theoretically complete a chill cat robe in 6 months, or she says 4 months, <laughs> but not including the spinning of her work. To learn this type of weaving, as Jenny Clanat recalls, 
um, and recorded in the downstairs book, Hakusti Yi. The descendants of the Gana Ganachtebi women unraveled the Sigedi, Sigedi Kedate shaman's apron, the beaver apron woven by Kaiwasla, a Simshian weaving, which I will say that it's also attributed to Niska, Nishka, and the Nishka people are Simshian, kind of like you would call us Eskimo or the New Piak Eskimo, Yupik Eskimo. They're Nishka Simshian people. So that's the history is telling us the same story. Um, again, we see the weaving return from women, women studying other girls. Jenny was in her 80s when she taught a few classes and took a few a couple apprentices and finally felt like that weaving tradition was not going to die with her. Researcher Evan wrote, back in the early 1900s, he feared for the loss of Chilkat weaving art form, as today but 15 weavers remain, and the majority of them are well advanced in years. Fortunately, between Cheryl Samuel, Jenny Clanat, her apprentice Clarissa Rizal, and numerous other student teachers, we have enough women and a few men to carry forward with the tradition. Many have learned Chilkat, but few weave often or, or make their living primarily from weaving. If a collector, a museum, or an individual wants to acquire a Chilkat robe, there's about 15 Chilkat weavers, maybe 10, who have completed a full-size Chilkat robe across the lower 48, Alaska or Canada. Luckily, there's at least this many in their 20s to 40s who showed promise to carry this Chilkat weaving into the future. Um, the spiritual life in the physical weaving of these textiles is vibrant and familiar. More so in Chilkat than in Raven's Tale because of the way Raven's Tale returned to us. There was no living master weaver who passed on the indigenous beliefs regarding uh, surrounding Raven's Tale weaving. I called my teacher, Kate Parker, to double check our do's and don'ts in Raven's Tale. And she said, there's two things. When we start a row, remember, we only read left to right in Raven's Tale. When we start that first row, we always finish it. We don't leave it just part way done. And secondly, when we place a treasure inside those concentric boxes, we always close the box before walking away from our loom. I'm sure each Raven's Tale weaver has certain practices from his or her time at the loom, and only time will tell what other spiritual beliefs develop in the coming centuries for Raven's Tale. The spiritual life in Chilkat is passed down from our master weaver, Jenny Tanat. My mother, teacher, Clarissa Rizal, writes, she didn't explain anything. She just said, this is the way it is. You pray each morning with gratitude for what you have and with gratitude for your ability to weave. You always come to your loom with a clean mind and body, and you never come with a negative mind, for this can get into your weaving and then get on that dancer or the buyer. You don't want to put that negative energy into your robe. Do not get big-headed about your weaving. You keep your ego in check. Tuck those thumbs in. <laughs> you be good to your husband, you take care of your children, and take time to eat and take care of your body. It's like she was saying exactly what I have experienced. That that I didn't I was getting sucked in and I only wanted to do chill cat and I was neglecting myself and all my family and my everything else and I was gonna just weave all the time. She in in not so many words as she was saying, you watch out, because this can consume you. This is bigger than you. So you cover your work each night, or whenever you're done weaving for the day, and in your design, you never, ever, ever weave human hands. Three fingers and a thumb is okay, but never five fingers. She actually screamed on a number of occasions, no human hands. When weaving a circle or an eye, you always allow for time to complete weaving them before going to bed. You don't want that negative energy, any negative energies of the night to get into those eyes. So you close them up before you go to bed. Do not show your in-progress weaving to the person who's buying it. And don't photograph your robe before you're done weaving it. It takes the, it takes the energy out of your sales. And lastly, men don't weave chilkat. And when we asked her, or when they asked her, hey, wait a minute, you taught a man, well, you're, you're going against what you're saying. Jenny explained, oh yeah, you know, he's different. He's funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, later we figured out, of course, that she had no translation for gay. Okay. So that's our exception here. Um, Jenny, Jenny would say over and over, look, it is enough that you were given this gift, the ability to weave a robe. It is no other thing, no other animal, but a human who made this weaving, and that is enough. 
In her time, she raised five children, did subsistence, had a job at the laundry, and she wove. It is enough just to leave the children. Regardless of where these spiritual beliefs come from, either the last living master chillcat weaver or the teachers who helped revitalize Dragon's Tale, we weavers and learners have a responsibility to our ancestors and to our teachers. We make an agreement each time we choose to weave. We will honor these teachings. The recent discourse on this tradition of chillcat weaving might be missing some of the Clinkett world views of our ancestors. An example is how this tradition is interpreted as having rules or laws some weavers are claiming to know these rules and knowingly break them, as we're an evolving people and culture. But they're not merely rules. When a weaver agrees to weave Chilkat, she commits to the spiritual life of a weaver, to honoring the worldview of her ancestors and her teachers, and to uphold the spiritual laws entrusted to her. This commitment has no restriction to personal or creative freedom but embodies the sacred agreements passed on from one honorable weaver to the next. These are not rules. These spiritual agreements are the fabric that upholds our universe of freedom. They bond us to our land, to our teachers, to our, to our ancestors who trust us, to honor twine by twine, braid by braid, the continually woven, strength-giving robes of our clinking lives. Thank you. Thank you.